good. Okay, we're going to go over the settings and we're going to test low bitrate content. YouTube TV, Chromecast, and you guys will see how they compare. I'll try to change the exposure so you can see if there's any macro blocking, but if you can't see it, listen to what I say. And if you haven't caught my review, so the UAK easily one of the better processors this year. I was very impressed. It was nearly a match for the G3 and sometimes beating it and macro blocking, smoothing it out, right? The QM8 and the Q7, I think they have the same processor. They were both a step behind and had similar issues. Monster Hunter being one and low bit rate content, you saw visible macro blocking. So, you know, it is what it is. Now the Sony X90L has the XR clear. The question is, what does it do? I don't see XR clear in any settings, so I assume it's just a software label that's in the TV. It's part of the TV, but it's not something you turn on or off that I found. So if I'm wrong, let me know. And okay, let's see. Any questions? Do I still have the U8H, Getty Man? So before I jump in, technically I do, but it's in the box. There's just only so much room. And because both the U8K and the QM8 were better, it was just like, oh, you know, okay, so let me just make my recommendation here as far as UHD is concerned. If you're just streaming, it is still a great TV. Streaming, just basic HDR. The issue with UHD is image processing is definitely a step behind the U8K, the U7K, and even the Q7 in certain scenes. So the UHD is great all around HDR impact. Boom. Lower quality content. I would actually look at the U7K because I think it's more distracting to have uh, pixelation and macro blocking. That affects the resolution, even if it's 4K or 1080p. But the U8H overall is fairly good as an HDR TV. And then gaming, it also falls behind. It doesn't have the motion resolution. The 4K 120 is not great. And it doesn't have the gaming features. So if you're looking at it as an all-around TV, including some console gaming, I would just wait for the U8K or the QM8 to drop in price, or even the U7K, yeah, would be better for gaming and stuff like that. So, yeah, sorry, Getty Man. There's just only so much space I have. Okay. Oh, and this is a great point right here. So, you know, talk about the U8K. So, in my last, in my review, I just posted this morning, right, the QM8 versus the U8K, there were some comments that, you know, it's so unfair. Why did you have U8K tone mapping on and the QM8 tone mapping off, you know? And so if you guys caught the live stream, you know why. Each TV, I want to set them up for success. And just because the TV has tone mapping on or off, it doesn't mean that all TVs should have the exact same setting. That's not how the TVs are made. As a matter of fact, the QM8 looks best with tone mapping off, whereas the Q7 looks best with tone mapping on. Same brand, different models, it's just tone mapping helps the Q7, the U7K, and the U8K. Tone mapping does not help, it hurts the QM8. So if I kept it on, you know what I'm gonna hear? I'm gonna hear you guys saying, oh, you know, you set up for failure, you should have known better, you should have had tone mapping off. And so it's off. But you're free to turn it on and prove me wrong, but trust me when I say it just, everything clips, it's just, it, everything is wrong, right? It just way too bright in all the wrong places. It's not a good look with tone mapping on unless you have this super bright scene and you want them to pull it down a little bit, maybe tone mapping will help. But I'd say 99% of the time, the QM8 leave tone mapping off. I just haven't found many situations where I said, you know what, I need to have it on. The UAK is the opposite, always leave it on. I found tone, dynamic tone mapping on the UAK to be consistently good. And then there was one more thing I forgot to mention. Many of you heard what I said and you wanted to look at tone mapping and compare and then you turn on the QM8 and you're like, wait, where's my tone mapping button? I don't even have the button. Internal apps, dynamic tone mapping disappears. So I tested on the Q7, you know, Prime Video, all the different ones that had HDR content and the TV shows HDR10, HDR10+, whatever no tone mapping feature. So dynamic tone mapping on the QM8 and the QM7 is limited to external HDMI, HDR sources. If you're internally apping, watching an internal app, you definitely need to um, know that there's no dynamic tone mapping available for you to toggle. And I thought it looked fine uh, with or without it. I think hopefully they choose the right 
one. And for those who came in, hey, where's the QM8? Uh, hardware malfunction. So the QM8, I will bring it back on later when I have it swapped and replaced. So today, it will be the U8K and the Q7 versus the Sony X90L. Yeah, while I was setting up the QM8, I'm like, oh man, I can't. That, it's unfair to the QM8 because when you get the QM8, you won't have the hardware malfunction because you'd swap it if you did. Suddenly, I have this bright vertical line, horizontal, like, what? What happened, right? And I, you know what? It is what it is. Panel lottery happens. So I'll just go to Best Buy and swap it out. I'm within my swap period anyway, so it doesn't matter. But that's just something that happens, right? So let me see. Oh, so this is YouTube TV. Let's go through the settings real quick, and then we'll talk about how the Sony compares to the other TVs in low bitrate content. So let's put that. Let's put up the TV settings first. So you guys know. Boom. Let's talk about TV settings right now. And hey, if you just joined us, I hope you're enjoying this. And if you are, don't forget to click like so that people on a Saturday afternoon who have nothing better to do, they could join us. So let's let's do this, right? So this is YouTube TV, and so you guys can see it is on HD 720p. So as you can see, this is Wimbledon. You would think maybe 1080p, maybe 4K. Nope, Wimbledon, YouTube TV, 720p. So that's great, right? That allows us, actually, you know what? Let's challenge it even more and go down to 480p. Let's see how it addresses low bit rate 480p, right? You never know. You know, we'll have fun with that. And so we'll see what happens. And I'm looking for what I normally look for, which is, oh, here we go. I'm looking for the background, the green background. And once he starts walking and there's a green background and everything, hopefully he won't let this may shut me down because we are testing, right? There we go. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this green background is just amazing. Anytime you have a gradient in the back, green, grays, and blues, you can catch the macro blocking. So let me go through the settings real quick so you guys see what I have on and off. So normally when we're watching a little bit of content, right? So let me go, oh, there we go. Uh, normally when you watch a little bit of content, the TV settings, you're gonna have to max out all of the noise reductions, especially anything that says smoothing, smooth gradient, smooth gradation, or some variation of that, and you'll see. So we'll start with VU8K, so my TV settings. And I'm going to put it on standard because I think most of you will watch tennis in standard mode. So we'll take it off Filmmaker, put HDR standard and automatic lens light sensor. Let's make sure that's off. I know Caleb mentioned that his Filmmaker, it felt a little dim and I think it was a panel lottery issue with him. My U8K did not have any brightness issues at all. It was just tone mapping as you guys saw. Focal limiting on high. Okay, I'm going to have active contrast on high because normally when you watch sports, this is what you want to easily read sports scores and the logos and all that good stuff. Dynamic tool mapping is on. If I turn it off, oh, it doesn't make a huge difference, but I'm going to leave it on just because I find that to be very helpful. Okay, so that's the U8K settings. Let's go to the Q7 settings. Sports mode. Dynamic contrast is on high for the same reason watching sports. Normally you sit on high, dynamic tone mapping is on is on high. Local contrast, that's the local living zone. I have that on high. Micro contrast on high because it makes it easier to read. Print, all right. So that's the Q7. And lastly, the Sony X90L settings. So picture mode. Let's go to standard. Light sensor is off. Brightness max, contrast 90. Brightness preferred, and most of you will put it on brightness preferred when you're in a brighter room, you're watching sports. So we don't care about gradient detail, right? We don't care about shadow detail. Black adjust, medium, that was default. So I'll just leave it on default. Advanced contrast enhancer high. Auto local dimming, high. Peak luminance, high. All right, clarity is where the noise reduction is. So, oh yeah, I forgot to show you the noise reduction on, <laughs> we'll do that next, on the U8K and the Q7. So uh, uh, reality creation, I'll put on auto, random noise, auto, digital noise, auto, smooth gradation, 
high. So that one I was very specific. All right. And let's go back to the Q7 so you can see the clarity. Yeah, that's very important. All right, advanced settings, clarity, sharpness 50, digital noise reduction high, noise reduction high, and gradation clear. This is what smooths out the macro blocking. Gradation clear is on high. QM8 has a similar setting when you're watching sports and stuff like that. Definitely leave it on high, especially if you're cable, watching cable or YouTube TV. Clarity on the U8K, super resolution, have it up. Smooth gradient, high, that's similar to the other ones. This one definitely on high, but all the other noise reduction is also on high. But just so you know, when I toggled the other stuff, not much of a difference. Okay, so let's go into, let's do this, low bit rate. Okay, this is the strength of the Sony. The question is, is it really? So, I'll tell you right now, the Sony does have the smoothest gradients. So the question is, can you see it, right? So right behind against its back, on the Q7, you can see some macro blocking. Uh, the U8K, fairly smooth. The Sony is both smooth and there's some shadow detail that is trying to preserve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to change change the exposure so you guys can see it better. Let me see if let me see if taking exposure down makes it easier to see. No, I think taking it up would be better. Okay, and let's see. I'm trying to get a scene where I can get some obvious macro blocking here. And it's great that the background has this weird grid thing happening. And remember, we're at 40p now. Okay, actually, this is a great place to pause because I want to go over how clear the words are. So on the top left-hand corner, you have two tennis players, Zverev and Berrettini. The question is, how easy is it to read these names? How easy is it to read everything? How clear is it when they're put in a setting designed to watch sports, right? Let me make sure... catch all your comments real quick. Okay, good. You guys can still hear me. Okay, so let me see here. Taking a step closer, the UAK feels like the letters are better resolved. Now remember, this is processing missing information. It's 480p. You are literally upscaling low bit rate and low resolution. All three TVs have to fill in the blanks. The algorithm, the software, the AI, whatever they call it, they use to fill in. The question is how sophisticated is it? The Sony is pretty good, but I'm liking the U8K more. Is it because it has better contrast, because it has more dimming zones? Maybe, but just looking at the words, it feels like the U8K is a touch clearer, but if it wasn't side by side, I think the Sony would be fine. So let's find another bit of content to see if, fast forward here. I'm looking for another, oh, here we go, that's a good one. Okay. Okay, so I'm seeing what the Hisense UAK is doing. 
in order to clean up the macro blocking, it's actually eliminating some of that detail or some of that shadow detail. It works. So what it's saying is, look, if your image is that bad, why don't we make everything the same shade? So the UAK has the least distracting macro blocking, but in return, there's a lot less gradient information, right? So to the left of, so you see it actually on the monitor, to the left of, or if you look at him on the left side, on the UAK, there's less shadow detail, right? It all looks like it's the same shade. The Q7 preserves the most detail, even though it's also on high smooth gradient, what the Q7 wants to do is to have as much information as possible, but in doing that, it's, it also may have more macro blocking. You can't have it both ways. Remember, there's not enough information for ADP. So it's trying to keep as much of it as possible, and then the Sony is kind of in between. It wants to clean up where it can, but also preserve some information. So the Sony is caught between the UAK just smoothening everything out and the Q7, which tries to preserve everything. The question though for you guys, which do you prefer? Because this is very subjective. At the end of the day, 480p is 480p. I mean, there's not a lot of information. For me, what's important is probably the motion resolution. So let's see how they do. And it doesn't look like, and in this mode, I have you know maximum soap opera. The key is always motion resolution. It doesn't, you know, need, none of these have any single advantage that can say, oh, oh, that was a good one. Let me try that one again. I'm looking at his suit. Yep, they all look pretty much the same. Here we go. Okay. I have to say, we've come a long way. Hisense. Hisense heard the complaints, and I think they made the right decision. The Q7, I mean, the best part is I'm going to lower the exposure just a touch because that gray area to his, to the left, there's a lot more shadow gradient on the Q7, very subtle wrinkles and everything, whereas on, I'm going to point out right now so you guys can see, it's kind of funny. There is this wrinkle that is not even there on the UAK. So, if I turn smooth gradation off on the UAK, does it come back? I turned down the exposure just a touch to make it more obvious, but not necessarily so. Okay, so let's see. I'll tell you what I see. The limitations of live streaming. Okay, let's see here. Smooth gradients on high. So if I turn it off, start with that. Yep, turning it off gives you all of that back. So you're able to adjust your preference for macro blocking and detail. If you want as much of those wrinkles that's on the Q7, just either go to low or turn off gradient detail altogether. But even the Sony and the Q7, at maximum, it's not extreme. With the high sense, they're giving you that too extreme. It's high, it's very high, it's smoothening everything, and it's off, well, it's off. So I like that Hisense has a wider range for extreme smoothening or no smoothening at all. Whereas both, well, okay, so Sony at high is even more smoothening than the Q7, but not as much as the U8K. And the Q7, even at high, has the least smoothening. And this appears to be why probably the Q7 and the QM8 macro blocking sometimes is an issue. They're not allowing it to be as aggressive. And I think they could. But right now, they're not. So I'm going to turn it back. Uh, or let, Well, let's see. Where does it match the Sony? So it's off. Let's, let's go to smooth gradient on 
low. Let's see what happens here. So on low, it's similar to the Sony. So it's quite a jump. From off to low, there's, there's nothing in between. Low gets it to where the Sony is. And obviously, if you go to medium and high, it's probably going to make all these things disappear altogether. So I'll put it back on high just because we're comparing the high smoothing feature on low bitrate content. But now you know, on the U8K and probably the U7K, you could take it to lower off and it'll be similar to Sony's aggressiveness in the smoothing. So it's back on high. And I'm going to change exposure, hopefully, back up again. So you guys can see the link I'm talking about. Oh, man, it's so hard to see. Oh, well. You guys have to listen to what I say. Um, let me know if you see those wrinkles <laughs> in that gray area. All right. Okay. So let's see what you guys, questions you guys have here. So, uh, Pilau says, it's weird because the grass looks the same, but the green material is greener on the high sense compared to the TCL. Oh man, this is definitely th this is definitely my my color, my sensor because it's it, it, not that green. So let me see what I can do to make it less green because that that is a bit green. I don't know why. That is just crazy. Yeah, you know what? It's not that green, guys. It, it's just. Let me see. Will this make it a little bit better? Nah. Yeah, this is, see, this is an example of camera sensor. It is definitely not that green at all. It, it is more of a dark green. So the TVs look fine. YouTube is definitely making things a bit more extreme. So I'm trying to make adjustments on my software to see maybe if I can help it out a bit. But And I have tint. Removing more green, it could even be greener if I didn't make the adjustments that I'm making right now. Maybe that's better? Oh yeah, there we go, that could be better. Okay, that looks a little bit more like what I see. Okay, any questions about, about the low bit rate YouTube? Let's see, and then we're gonna move on. Generally speaking, the, it, so the TCL of the three TVs, only the TCL is calibrated. But as I've said before, try not to look at the color saturation. As I change the exposure, saturation will change. And between my sensor and YouTube compression, what it does with color, there's no guarantee that the saturation is correct or incorrect, right? So TCL generally has a touch red after calibration even, and the UK is uncalibrated and the Sony is, in, and they're all in standard mode, by the way, or some variation of standard. So even the colors are not most accurate. So let's move on to, while well, speaking of color accuracy, let's go to skin tones and let's see what happens there. So let's get out of a little bit rate streaming real quick. Oh, hey, Mark J, thank you for that super chat. Let me move myself out of the way here. Hi, Samsung Q90B has extreme oversaturated yellow spots on skins in HDR movie mode when I stream Netflix, but old laptop also. Any advice? This is interesting. The Q90B is supposed to be accurate in its filmmaker mode, so make sure that someone didn't screw with your colors. So if you didn't have it calibrated already, reset the TV to factory default settings you know, while you're there. And then I know the most recent firmware update, no complaints, but double check that. I think it's okay. So if you want to upgrade your firmware, go ahead and do that. Now, filmmaker mode, in filmmaker mode, out of the box, factory out of the box. The Q90B actually isn't bad in terms of skin tones and color saturation. That's the best I can suggest because filmmaker mode from Samsung last year and this year is actually pretty good. So if it continues to be an issue, it could be a panel lottery where you just have splotchy yellows. Hopefully that's helpful. Let, let us know. Try that and let me know if that helped.
All right, let's go. Moving on to, let me go to Filmmaker settings real quick and we'll see what happens. All right, we have, we'll do some Dolby Vision comparisons just to see if Sony has changed the Dolby Vision. And just to address Dolby Vision real quick, so if you guys aren't aware, in the past, Dolby Vision dark on Sony TVs have been a little bit too dark, with the exception of the Sony A95K last year, which is very accurate out of the box. Sony has traditionally made their Dolby Vision Dark too dark, and so most people just leave it on Dolby Vision Bright, which is fine, right? I mean, it looks better. The question is, have they fixed that this year on the X90L? We're going to check that out. But on the other side of it, high sense Dolby Vision tends to be a little bit lifted. So last year's U8H was a little bit lifted. This year I'm seeing it with the U8K as well. So Dolby Vision Dark on the U8K, everything is a little bit too bright. The shadow details, just everything, right? It just feels almost washed out to a certain degree. The QM8, shockingly, the Dolby Vision is so good out of the box. And Dolby Vision Dark, nearly indistinguishable from the LG G3, which had its Dolby Vision calibrated. So uh, pretty impressive, Bravo QM8. And we'll see the Q7 similar. I think the Q7 similarly, their Dolby Vision out of the box is pretty good. So if Dolby Vision is important to you, but something to keep in mind, without Dolby Vision, same content, the U8K looks fine. The QM8 looks fine, looks very similar. The G3, however, OLED, we're talking OLED, HDR in the same content, it feels a bit crushed. And I don't know why. I don't, I think it's just a G3 Dolby Vision, it looks like it should look, very similar to QM8, but the HDR10 version, talking The Witcher, if you see my review, everything's a bit darker in the shadow, and some would call that crushing, and seeing that the QM8 looks the same in Dolby Vision and the HDR10, I'm tending to think that the G3 may have crushed the HDR10. But hey, that's my conclusion, right? It, Dolby Vision just adds a bit of confusion to everything. So let's look at skin tones out of the box. I'm gonna change it to Filmmaker now. I believe we were in standard mode or whatever. So let's see how Filmmaker TV settings look. And we're, we're gonna do HDR content. Here we go. All right, so let's start with the Q, uh, U8K. We're going to go to Filmmaker mode. Oops, wrong one. Automatic light sensor off, great. I thought I'd, oh, I could always check that, you never know. Local dimming always on high if you're in HDR. Dark detail off, active contrast off, dynamic tone mapping on because it looks best with dynamic tone mapping on. And let's make sure clarity is all off, super resolution off, smooth gradient off, noise reduction off. Uh, motion clearness off. Let's see here, motion enhancement, custom. So normally my jutter reduction is at three. That's how I like it. Any more might be too much soap, any less too much stutter. So for me, this is fine. Blur reduction, I don't think makes a huge difference. I just leave it at seven. Okay, so that's the QM8. And the, Q, I'm sorry, that's the U8K. And the U8K is uncalibrated. The Q7, 
obviously. It's not in the correct <laughs> picture mode. That's why it looks all wonky. So it's in sports mode. Let's put it back in movie mode. Brightness 100, color saturation 49. And now Q7 was, it was calibrated by Sammy Prescott, so I'm just leaving it as it was. 100 brightness, 100 contrast, uh, dynamic contrast, off, black stretch, off. Playing with those two, I didn't think it did anything, so I don't think it really matters. Dynamic tone mapping on. Local contrast is local dimming high. Micro contrast off, gamma 2.2, fine. All right, Sony is up. Oh wait, yeah, let's make sure the clarity processing is off so there's no smoothening. Yeah, all off, okay. Sony, let's get you back up to custom. Is Sony's most accurate out of the box? Brightness, maximum, contrast 90, gradation preferred. All the other enhancements are off. Auto local dimming on high, peak luminous on high. Clarity. All clarity is off because we're going to use the highest quality content sources, so those don't need to be on. Oops. And for me, motion on the Sony is not as aggressive because they do a great job. So my motion is normally smoothness at one and clearness is minimum and Cinemotion on high. I like Cinemotion. I don't see the soap. Some people might not. So that's to taste. There is no right answer. Okay. Now, the Q7 is calibrated, but let me turn up the brightness. One more. Interesting. Out of the box, the Sony looks very much <laughs> like a UAK. Not offensive. So we'll just go through the different skin tones so you guys can see. It's actually very similar. Again, the Q7 is calibrated and the other two are not. And this is HDR. That looks fine to me. The Sony looks very much... Okay, so I have to say, we know Sony's great colors, but I got to add it to the U8K. Now, there is a touch... It feels there is a touch of green on the U8K more than the Sony. But it's so subtle. but it's not so bad that I see it here. Normally in pale skin, this is where that touch of green really comes out, but it's not that evident here. So it's only some skin tones, but other than that, this looks fine on out of the box, UAK and Sony. Yeah. And Okay, now let's get to real content. I know you guys are waiting for that. We are going to start at 2000 nit content because the reality is testing at 10,000 nit, all it does is really how good are how prepared were the software designers when they did any of these TVs? If they spent any time getting these TVs to optimize for 10,000 nit content, all they were doing is getting it ready for reviewers like me using the Spears and Muscle test disc. The reality is really good tone mapping at 10,000 nits does not help you guys at all, frankly, because nothing is at 10,000 nits. I mean, a few movies, maybe at 4,000, 2,000, still not that many. So what I'm going to do is take the 2,000, use the 2,000 nit trim just to see how they 
how all the TVs do it. And even at 2,000 nits, less than a handful that you guys will be realistically seeing. But streaming Prime, Disney+, Plus, Netflix, HDR, YouTube, 2,000 is more than enough and is excessive. It's actually 1,000. That's very important. But, you know, we'll do 2,000 just to see the capability of these TVs. And what I've noticed is also... If they're weak at 2,000, they suck at 10,000. So, <laughs> so 2,000 would be a great proxy for 10,000 anyway. That way we can save some time. So, all right, so let's get into 2,000 nit real quick. And then I'll, I'll pause, look at your questions as I put this in slow-mo. All right, let's see what you guys got going on here. All right, what questions you got, friends? And I'm making sure I don't miss any super chats here. Hey, thank you for that super chat, G Giddy Man, Giddy G Man. Any noticeable change about the UK since the new update? If yes, what was it? So, <laughs> since my live stream, I think I went through almost three updates. Literally, there was an update last night. I was like, ah. Oh, I post my review and the updates up like, oh no, did, did they fix any of the stuff I complained about? So I went straight to tone mapping and they didn't address tone mapping. So apparently it's some UI things to make it easier. So it's mostly UI. As far as image processing, nothing. Uh, the 2000 nit was still, and you're gonna see it right here. So I updated all the TVs 30 minutes before I started the stream. I went through it again, made sure all the over there updates available. So I ran it. And so all the three TVs are updated, the Sony, the U8K, and the Q7. But it appears that so far the U8K updates have been more to the usability, the operations, but not necessarily that I saw the image processing or the algorithm for blooming control. Still excellent, but clipping of 2,000-bit, well, let's see. Uh, I, th I thought I still saw it, so they haven't addressed that. And I don't think it should be a priority for now. I mean, if there are other things they should address, they should because none of you will notice clipping if you're watching streaming content. Now you might see it here and there, and we're gonna have real movies on so you guys can see, but even then, I didn't see it on the bright movies either. All right, so let's get through this. And we'll pause where I think, oh, this is interesting to see the different grades. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna rewind this one. So at 2000 nits, Pause it right here. I have to say, the Sony, it looks pretty bright. I'm gonna take a deep breath and say the Sony is doing a phenomenal job here. First, it's specular highlights is brighter than the Q7 with less dimming zones. Now, not significantly less. The Q7 has what? Just over 100. The Sony has just under 100. Not a huge difference in dimming zones. But the Sony is doing more with less than the Q7 in this scene. It's actually very close to the U8K. Now, this is 2000 content, right? So let's see what happens. Now I'm going to turn up the exposure and let's see how the black levels are. But right here, my goodness, the contrast on the Sony is... Is a match for the U8K. Oh, if only the QM8 was available. Okay, let's turn up the exposure. And... Very good job, Sony. Look at the clouds. So, not only is the brightness in that center area of the clouds a match for the U8K in this scene, and this scene is not a particularly bright scene, but I'm just loving that they preserved the contrast in the clouds, which is a, a touch darker than the U8K. This gives us that three-dimensionality we're talking about. It has the wide dynamic range. The Q7 could do better. So the Q7, as you can see, it feels very... Uh, two-dimensional right uh, it doesn't look exciting the, the Sony a win in this scene not a hard scene but you know what you take your wins where you can get it yeah. 
All right, let's move on. That was actually a pretty good one. So we're at 2,000 nits. All right, so. Oh. There you go. Okay, I'm going to pause right here. So here's where the Q7 and the QM8 beats everybody, is the amount of detail in this scene. It feels like the Q7 and the QM8, I, I checked all of these scenes, they both have the same tone mapping algorithm, very well done. When it's 2,000 nits, they know when to bring it down to get all the details, but the brightness doesn't drop that much, but you're getting it all, right? The grass and everything. And so the Sony and the U8K, both similarly less detail than the Q7. Turn down the brightness a bit so you can see more of that grass. The Sony is actually slightly worse than the U8K. So for those of you who are saying, oh, Sony software, when it comes to tone mapping, Sony has never been good at 2000 nits, by the way, or rather their mini LED LCD TVs. A95K, stuff like that, even the QD OLED is challenged with tone mapping bright scenes. And I think it's mostly because Sony feels what I was saying, Where's this 2000 nit content you claim, right? Other than Spears and Munsell, where is it at? And so you can see that Sony doesn't care. At 2000 nits and above, whatever, clipping the details, because realistically, other than this scene, you're not gonna find it anywhere. So let's see though, Dolby Vision content. Not here, but we're gonna come back and go through and see if they can do Dolby Vision at 10,000 nit, if it's any better, and it should be. So we're gonna see if Sony is darker in Dolby Vision, but here's what I find is interesting. Dolby Vision on Spears and Munsell, right? Different than Dolby Vision on Netflix, for whatever reason. So what, so I'm finding that I'm gonna to have to double check how Dolby Vision looks on Netflix with different content, because what I see in the Spears and Munsell does not reflect what I'm seeing in content. It's uh, as many of us have said, you know, sometimes it looks brighter, sometimes it looks darker. No rhyme or reason. It's just crazy. All right, let's move on. All right, let me let me pause this next one. So, hey, great comment here. I'm gonna slow this down a bit. So, bring Brian and Vistage up on the show. So, originally Brian was going to be on the show, and then last minute conflict, he couldn't make it. So. You know what? You guys are going to see him for three days at least, at least two days, at three days at M Wave. So you're going to get a lot of Brian, trust me, next week. And he's trying to get ready for that. So in the meantime, you know, he's going to get his things in order. So, you know, Brian, don't worry about it. Do your thing. I'll run solo on this. But yeah, originally Brian would be on. So that's right, it's Vincent. I don't know. He's in England, in different time zones. Because oftentimes I'm like, Brian, are you free tomorrow? So it's always last minute, right? Oh, TV's here. Are you free tomorrow? And most people don't work on that time frame, right? They got to plan everything out. So, you know, it is what it is. If they're available, great. If not, oh, actually, let's, let's, this is an interesting. The reason why I say it's interesting is because, okay, the Q7, you could probably see it because I see it right here. It doesn't have as much contrast or brightness at the top of that mountain. The Sony, very similar to the U8K. And this is impressive that the Sony is able to do this with less dimming zones than the Q7. So I just had to stop right there. This is where the Sony, you know, 2000 nits, great, but the Q7 is a touch behind the Sony. Now, it's literally almost half the price. So you're seeing the price differences as well. So, you know, just had to mention that. This is a good scene for that. And if you're enjoying this, let me know. Oh, let me move this over. Don't forget to click like so more people could jump on this stream and have fun. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about in terms of shadow detail in the clouds. So both the Sony and both the Sony and the U8K clips the shadow detail in the clouds right here. So this is where they're like, whatever, we're gonna clip that brightness. It's gonna be super bright, no detail. Q7 on the other hand, 
preserves some of that detail, but it's not as bright. So, you know, choose your poison. You get it bright, but lost detail. You don't have it bright, you have some detail. And of course, at 1000 nit, I'll show you, they all have detail. And this is why you can tell they're just focused on 1000 nit content. Oops, let's go back. Oh yeah, right there. Okay, so you can see with the U8K, I'm gonna pause it right here. Oops. Okay. So the UAK has the most dynamic range. It pops the most. The Sony is just behind, and the Q7 is about two steps behind, easily a step behind the Sony. So the 1000 nit content, this is where most of our content lives. UAK definitely is showing its strength here, but the Sony is not that far behind. Actually, this is probably the best I've seen Sony do this stuff, <laughs> uh, especially at the X90 range. So, so far, not bad, not bad at all. All right, let's bring it back to 2000 nits. And we're gonna go through the scenes where I know they will have a challenge, like this one. Oh, what a great scene. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. All right, so as you can see, 2000 nits, the UAK is just shining, literally just shining this one. It preserves a lot of the cloud detail and it's a bit brighter than all the TVs. And you saw at the same exposure, where the Sony, you saw detail, the UAK was just like, right? So I had to lower the exposure a bit so that you can see that UAK indeed has all the detail. It's just super bright, truly trying to hit 2000 nits. Whereas the Sony, conservative, I mean, you can only do what it can do. It does not want to clip at 2000 nits. And so in this one actually does a good job. And the Q7 is behind all of them. As good as it is, compared to the Sony, it feels very washed out in this scene. You don't even see that. So you lost color on the Q7 and you lost that dynamic range, right? So this is, this is a, the Sony definitely is just a touch behind the U8K, but what happens if we go down to 1000 nits? Is it a match? That's the question. So we'll see. All right. Okay, so here we are, and indeed, so the UAK, a touch brighter, just a touch, but the Q7, even a thousand nits, doesn't compare to the Sony. Uh, it, it lacks that color pop in it. But again, the Q7 is calibrated. Maybe that's what it's supposed to look like, right? <laughs> so that's another issue. But I think just... I know that this scene does have colors. So I just think the Q7, it does, and again, it's at $850. Sony's 1499 right now, probably 1300 by the time Black Friday rolls around. U8K is just under 1300 or at 1300 right now. And so on 1,000 nits, U8K, a touch, just a touch more brightness, but the Sony X90L, I, I wouldn't reject it based on the scene alone for sure. So let's go up to 2000 again, see what happens. And I have my Panasonic UB820 back. That's why I feel like I have full control over, over these scenes. All right, let's move to the next one. This is a good one that's coming up right here. The bright steam right there. Okay, so 
Yes, the UAK is a bit brighter, where the brighter part, brightest part of that steam is, and we know that. So if we go down to 1,000 nits, and the Sony does fine. Very similar to the U8K. And the Q7 is just, I mean, it's just right there, so close to the Sony. It, this one is one that's very similar between all three of them. U8K possibly a touch brighter in the brightest spot, but very close. Okay, moving on, let's go to this next scene. Oh yes, right after the buffalo, this is a good one. Okay, we're at 1,000 nits. And definitely, definitely the U8K, the sun in the U8K is a touch brighter. So even at a thousand nits, when it comes to these bright points, I see what the Sony X90L is doing. It doesn't want to lift that entire area because it doesn't have enough dimming zones. It's going to pull the brightness down just a little bit so that it can capture all the color gradients, but it doesn't have any more color than the Sony X or than the Hisense U8K. Your Hisense U8K is just simply brighter. But definitely the Sony does a better job than the Q7. And let me try to turn down exposure touch. Okay, so by turning down exposure, you can see that the high sense has the same level of color gradients, color luminance, all the detail that's there, but it's just a little bit brighter. And the Sony being gradient preferred it or gradation preferred it's preserving all of that and the q7 a step behind so so far i'm seeing do not get the q7 as a poor man's version of the sony it's not it's just not there you either get the u8k or if you like sony color science and the like you get the sony but the q7 is not a good replacement of course and the qm8 is always available so we'll see how they do at a later date Oh, you know what? This is a great question, Lisa. Let me get to this question as we check these things here. Okay, what is the difference between the A90J and the A80L? So the A90J, obviously, older OLED panel. More importantly, the A90J was the first OLED TV in the USA with a heat sink. It got everyone excited. Turned out, didn't do anything at all. So the heat sink did not make it brighter. Ooh, I'm going to pause right here. The heat sink did not make the A90J brighter. But what it did allow the A90J do, to do was maybe have a higher sustained APL for a full screen, a little bit brighter. But the reality is the A90J ended up not being a bright TV regardless of the heatsink. And ironically, the A80K that came after it ended up being as bright without a heatsink. And so the A80L is a better TV than the A90J for two important reasons. One, it has the most updated processor, including XR Clear. A90J does not have that. Now, that's not to say A90J isn't a great TV. It's pretty good. If you're just streaming normal content, though, don't spend the extra on the A90J. It's just built to a higher standard, but it's not a better looking TV. It was the first to use acoustic glass as well. So you're paying a little extra for these first introductions, right? And of course, it's a master series. That master series does come with a few things, including, you know, they've been there their panels so that you're less likely to have a panel lottery issue. But if you have a good, clean panel on the A80L, it is going to be the better OLED TV because it's just newer. It's using LG's latest generation Evo EX OLED panel. And that's two years, like almost two years of development 
after the A90J. So the A90J ends up being a master series in name, but image quality, you're gonna get more brightness out of the A80L. And I just like the A80L in terms of it being newer. It'll have you know, a better menu system and so forth. So yeah, it's unfortunate it's so expensive because then you're led to believe, oh, it must be better because it's more expensive. Nope. Oh, look who's here. Hey, Classy. Welcome, welcome. Yes, we'll see if they do well in dark scenes. So I wanted to pause here because this is at 1000 nit and the UAK is slightly brighter because the Sony wants to preserve some color. The UAK, even though it's slightly brighter, it's lost some of that color. It's more white, whereas the Sony has a haze, which was intentional, right? So it just depends on your taste. If you want that pop, UAK has it in droves because it's just brighter, more dimming zones. So it can be more aggressive. Sony, oh, actually, in this scene, the Q7 is brighter as well. So, and you can see more color in the Sony, right? So Sony is like hitting its color gradation fame here. It's like, oh, I want to preserve all the color. And it did. Definitely taste. There's no wrong answer. But you need to know what the differences are. So if you prefer all that color and, you know, less HDR pop, Sony's got it. And so the Q7 has lost a lot of that detail that's in the sun. So in the sun, I'm going to lower the exposure. There's some subtle cloud cover, cloud shadows that the UAK has and the Sony has. The UAK is a touch brighter and it preserves all of that. Sony preserves all of that, although slightly less bright. And the Q7 is, is just bright, but there's no clouds or anything. Right? It's just that bright spot. So the Sony is definitely making sure you're getting all the detail. And this is at a thousand nits. So the question is, if we were to go to two thousand nits, go. Who preserves what? So at 2000 nits, Q7 is just all clipped out. There is nothing there in the Q7. And surprisingly, the Sony doing very well. It's aggressively tone mapping this so that it can get all that detail in. This is a Bravo for the Sony. And the UAK is going for brightness, but some of that detail is still there. Definitely not as clipped as the Q7. You lose a little bit though, but it's trying to hit that brightness of 2000 nits that's demanded of it. So I don't think there is a wrong answer here. I think both have their intended impact, but if I turn up, the exposure, you'll notice that the Sony, where it's supposed to be dark, it's actually darker. So I think the Sony may have better HDR impact in the scene because the cloud cover is a bit darker where it should be darker. So this is very interesting. Okay, so look at, those, look at those clouds. The UAK, in order to get that area bright, it kind of lifts the brightness all around of the entire scene. The Sony, the cloud cover, is a little bit darker than the other two TVs. Overall, this gives you that dynamic range and the HDR impact you want. So I think this scene is a win for the Sony because once you look at it in the context of the scene, the Sony has that three-dimensionality of super bright, small point, and a darker area that's realistic, right? The cloud cover, the ominous gloom. Sony has more of that ominous gloom. There we go. There's the ominous gloom, all right. And at 2,000 nits, no less. So 
It's only when the entire scene is super bright and there are little specks of detail where the Sony really struggles, as well as U8K. Okay, so we're going to get to the waves and the rocks and see which one maintains some good dynamic range in the waves or the rocks that's coming up. Or not. Okay, here we are. All right. So. So the white, I mean, I'll pause right here. Q7 has the worst contrast in this scene. The rocks are left, that giant rock that you see, let me turn down exposure. Okay. At 2000 nits, the Sony and the U8K, very similar. The Q7 loses some of the contrast detail, although the blacks are nice and deep. And we're talking pixel peeping at this point because they're side by side, I'm able to see this. But the Sony actually has even more, a little bit more shadow detail than the U8K at 2000 nits. So let me turn on the exposure so you can see what I'm talking about. I want to point to the stone down there, that giant stone, the Sony, has more speckles of black and white, little sparkles. UK has it, Q7 doesn't have either, it's just a rock. Whereas Sony and the UK, you see the speckle, but on the Sony, it feels like the speckles are more vibrant. Now this is at 2000 nits. I'm wondering if at 1000, they end up looking the same. I was just trying to turn on the exposure if that helps. And it does help demonstrate that the Q7 is behind the U8K and the X90L. So by turning on exposure, you can see that the Q7, it's just, I mean, and so you saw how the Q7 has been doing really well with tone mapping, but this scene, it really struggled. Oh, hey, Tex got a super chat. Hey, KG, how are you, my friend? Thank you for dropping by. Yes, it is looking good, high def. It really is. Um, definitely, it's a step above the Q7. I'm trying to push it against the U8K, and it's keeping up so far. Hey, thanks, KG. Loving the guitar, bro. <laughs> I say, KG, my guitar. He's learning to play the guitar. By the way, good job comparing these. Sony does really well. Yes, I, I think Sony... I have to say, I was not impressed with the X90J, X900H, X90K. This X90L... So there's something happening. Maybe it's the XR clear, but definitely something's happening. And let me try at 1000 nits where most often this is where content lies. So let's do that. See if the Q7 can do a little bit better. And the Q7 is not. So the Q7 isn't terrible, but I'm seeing a lot more of that tiny little details, right? So turning up the exposure, you can see that the Sony actually has better shadow detail than either the Q7 or the U8K. And this is why the Sony looks so good in this scene. It has great contrast. 
it goes a little bit deeper in the shadows and it goes as bright as a UAK. And so when I turn up the exposure, how does it look? It looks phenomenal. And the Q7, you know, it looks the same, but UAK, you can see that it, it is a touch more lifted in this scene compared to the Sony. And that's kind of been the issue with the UAK this year is some of these scenes, it feels like it's a bit lifted. Now we're on the Spears and Munsell, so it's a little bit different. When we go to action movies, we'll see how they perform. But I'm, I'm giving Sony a thumbs up, mostly because the UAK we know has just over a thousand dimming zones. I know many of you are saying, oh, what about the QM8? Next time, my friends. So what's happening next is the UAK is going to go to M-Wave to be given away to some lucky winner this week. And in the meantime, the QM8 will be swapped out at Best Buy. It'll be back. That is going to be my mini LED standard this year. Even though its image processing is not necessarily as good as the U8K, and we saw that in Monster Hunter, but its brightness, local dimming, and contrast is near OLED-like, which is what I want to see. Because I think software could be addressed in terms of that stuff, but it's really hard to make an LCD TV look like an OLED in terms of contrast, and the QM8 did it, right? They did it in so many scenes in movies that I really enjoy watching, and that, I think, is going to be a great comparison to next year's X95M, if it comes in a 65-inch. So we'll see how that goes. But so far, bravo, Sony. And exposure is up, I know. Let me turn it back down. Oh, wait. Huh. Let's let's test. Let's let's keep it up. Let's look at uh, the local. Let's look at the blooming real quick here. So we're in the blooming zone. There we go. And we'll see how they do in blooming. I'll turn the exposure up some more. Okay, and to nobody's surprise, of course, the Sony blooms a little bit more. Um, as a matter of fact, the Q7 is doing quite well. <laughs> so it's clear that Hisense and TCL has been listening to us. We always complain about blooming. And the fact that the Q7 can be as bright, almost as bright as the UAK, not quite as you can see the UAK is very bright, but it's definitely as, it's definitely possibly a touch brighter than the Sony, but no blooming. With under 200 dimming zones, it's doing a phenomenal job controlling the blooming. And now it's overexposed. If I bring it down to what I see, the blooming is barely, barely noticeable. The UAK, obviously phenomenal because it's super bright and the blooming is well controlled. The Q7 doesn't get as bright, but its blooming control is perfect, especially at this overexposed scene. But if I take it down to normal viewing brightness or exposure, you guys probably will not notice the blooming like it used to be before. So Sony with, what, 80 dimming zones? This is such an improvement over past Sony's. But again, there is still some blooming, right? It is what it is. But, well, this is where the Q7 really does, does well. So I have to hand it to the Q7 with only 30, 40, 50 more dimming zones than the Sony. It's, it's doing a phenomenal job. And it's a touch brighter than the Sony, but not as bright as the U8K. And the U8K has always been very good at anti-blooming, meaning the last year's U8H and the prior years, right? So the, the 8 and 9 series from Hisense has consistently been one of the best at blooming control. The TCL Q7 has caught up. And Sony, well, they chose less dimming zones. So this is kind of the weakness of the Sony. But again, how often are you guys watching this brightness? Now, this is a 1,000 nits, right? So let's see what happens. If we go to 2000, does it get worse? Does Sony toe map it down so it doesn't change? We'll see. And let's go back. Okay. Well, didn't get any worse. So Tony did a, uh, Sony did a good job kind of bringing the brightness down to make sure that it could con contain some of that blooming. So 
to be expected. I'm not complaining. I know it doesn't have enough dimming zones. What I don't understand, Sony, is so the X95K, X95L, you could get 500 dimming zones, I believe, and still preserve the price, but you don't. And I'm just imagining with this software and more dimming zones, I think you could really take over. I'm just saying. So we're going to go to the Ferris wheel next, and then we'll get to questions and any super chats you guys may have, because I think since I'm in high, con I'm in the uh, high exposure zone. So, so as you can see at 2,000 nits, obviously the UAK can get brighter than the other TVs where the brightest part is. Both the Sony and the TCL Q7, they're very similar. They just cannot get that bright at 2,000 nits. Again, overexposed for those who just joined us. Sometimes they're overexposed to check blooming, and that's what we're doing here. In real HDR content at 2,000 nits, what is that blooming like? So I'm just going to quickly forward through. Because all of these scenes, they're full screen, and all the TVs look great. Like, oh, actually, I'm just going to stop here. The Sony's doing really well in the scene. So, oh, still too bright. Is this better? Ah, oh, it's so hard because it's Rec 709. Okay, so you guys have to trust what I say. The Sony has deeper colors than the other two TVs. The U 8K, slightly brighter, but the Sony has more depth of color, and the Q7 is the most washed out in terms of both contrast and color depth. So this is a really good one because it really jumped out at me. I want to have all the TVs side by side. I really like how the Sony rendered this scene, but it's, I could not capture it. I apologize. All right, let's get to the, the infamous Ferris wheel. Squirrel looks great. Tulips look great. Nothing to see here. Clock looks great. Oh, yes, this is a good one. At 2000 this, this gets very bright, and blooming becomes a huge issue if, boom, there you go. Okay. So the Sony is subtly more blooming, slightly, but I like this scene because the entire screen is slightly bloomed, so it's less obvious. If it was only blooming around where the brightest areas are, it makes it more obvious it's blooming. In this scene, Sony did a pretty good job of allowing the entire screen to lift a bit, so relatively speaking, it doesn't stand out. And this is something that I appreciate. Now, I don't see it blooming this much, obviously, because it's being overexposed, but at normal exposures, it's not as noticeable. So this is a normal exposure, right? I mean, it's a little bit overexposed. And now you see, oh, OK, it's not too noticeable. In the past, this would have been very noticeable on the Sony. All right, we're almost there. We're almost happy. Oh, this is a great one. Let me just check their respective contrast.
All right, and we're going to leave it at this exposure because it allows me to check two things. The depth of their blacks, right? Uh, so the Sony actually has very good blacks in the scene. The U8K, it's bright, but you know, everything's slightly lifted. The Q7 is doing pretty good. So this is a scene where the Q7 and the Sony actually look phenomenal. Now, the U8K is a little bit brighter. And so because it's hitting, trying to hit that 2000 nit specular highlight, it's causing everything around it to lift a bit. And this is where the OLED really works well. But, you know, let's move on to the scene you've all been waiting for. Let's see how it does with the Ferris wheel. We're looking between the spokes. How well does it do between the spokes? And we are there. Boom. Okay. Not bad. Oh. Not bad at all. Okay. Yes, slightly blooming, but in the past, Sony could not do this scene without going crazy with blooming. The top of the first wheel is very impressive. I'm overexposing it. Well, I'm going to expose it even more. Okay, I'm hyper-exposing. Where it counts is between the spokes. As you can see, the Sony is about as bright as the Q7 and slightly, just slightly lifted near where everything is below the, I guess where the, the pillars are, right near the water, that's where the Sony is hurting. Q7 does that very well, right? It's maintaining deep blacks where the below the boardwalk, I guess. That's where Sony's struggling. Everything feels kind of lifted. It's not black, black, but baby steps. Before, Sony could not even do the scene, even with more dimming zones, like the X95J would be a mess. So this is progress for so few dimming zones. I'm impressed by the Q7, actually, uh, how it's able to preserve all the black levels yet bring out the brightness of the columns beneath the boardwalk. And of course the U8K, this is its thing, right? It does this very well. So at 2000 nits, this is great. Now, if this was normal content at 1000 nits, what would happen? So let's see. Dropping to 1000 nits. And eh, it's about the same. So the Q7 and the U8K actually cleans up a bit more because it's scaling very well with a brightness at 1000. The Sony, it's, it's doing its best, but below the pillars, it's a little bit better contrast than at 2000, but still it doesn't match the black levels of the U8K and the Q7. So these scenes is what I use to say, okay, when you're fine tuning, your algorithm, your software, how difficult, like what are you hitting? And Sony's hitting the 80%, meaning 80% of the scenes are gonna look amazing and possibly better than the Q, or it will be better than the Q7, but possibly matching or beating the U8K. However, the 20%, you know what? You gotta choose your poison and Sony chose its 80%. And what we're seeing here is the 20% it chose not to. And so we're gonna watch some movies next. The question is, how about the movies we're watching? Is that the 80%? And I think that's going to be very telling. But before we jump into movies, let's, let's check out some of your questions. All right. Let me put this on slow-mo for you all. Let's see if you guys share my observations and catch some super chats, if any. Let me scroll up. And again, I apologize if I missed your questions or super chats. But here we go. Ah, I think Lisa is... My first Miss Super Chat, I think. Yes. Okay, Lisa. Thank you for that Super Chat. Let me, there you are. What size is your Q7? All TVs are 65 inches. UAK Q7 and Sony X90L. What kind of panel? The UAK and the Q7 are VA panels. I know that larger panels, there are some question as to whether it's ADS or not. I honestly don't know because I don't have them. Uh, I'll check with TCL and 
Hisense, but they don't always share that information. And the Sony, I believe, is a VA panel. Oh, it's a lot of noise in this. Oh, sorry about that. A bit too much noise when I hyperexposed. And how is off angle view? We'll do it at the end. So at the end, I'll move the camera to the side and then we'll see. We'll, we'll choose a couple of scenes on Spears and Munster. Well, I know there's a lot of rich colors. So you guys can see off angle, on angle, how the colors are. Remind me uh, later before I forget. I think I have it in my list of things to do. Yep, I do. So we're not going to miss that. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that. All right. Next up is. Hot KG before I got Lisa. Okay, you're welcome. I hope you enjoy the guitar, buddy. Okay, do you do you recommend buying TVs from Amazon as good as Best Buy? Personally, I like Best Buy because they're local to me. I have literally three Best Buy stores around me within 15 minutes. That allows me options to pick up, drop off. If one's in stock here, one isn't, and I have a distribution center 45 minutes away. Or actually two of them, right? I have a Compton distribution center and one up in Ontario somewhere. So as soon as like the 77 inch S95C, as soon as that was available, I was able to pick it up before I even hit the stories, right? So for me, Best Buy is a thing. You know, forget that they occasionally sponsor my videos, but I just like that they're here and returning it, just drop it off, I'm done. Like the UB820, they swapped it. I got an all new two year warranty again, right? So I bought it 18 months ago, it failed, got a new one. Boom, two more years, right? So I kind of like that. Now, Amazon, the Q7, I picked up from Amazon. So I don't have issues with Amazon. My first TCL, six series, I bought from Amazon. The thing is, if I have problems and I have to ship it back, I do not like carrying a box to a UPS. I mean, it's just easier to go to Best Buy, call them, and say, hey, can you guys come out and help me? carry the TV in, they're ready to come out, right? So I like the convenience, but I haven't had issues with Amazon in terms of returning bad panels. I've had bad panels, and Amazon's been fine for that. But be wary, I've had a few friends who I think they had just bad luck. They had two TVs in a row that the panels weren't working, and then on their third one, Amazon just shut down their account, you know, claiming, hey, you know, you guys are whatever, I don't know, gaming the system. And they're like, I think it was Brandon, which is Amazon. Not only did they reject it, right? They shut down his account. And guess what? His account was connected to his, his ring. I mean, his whole house was like, Alexa, everything shut down. I'm like, dude. So the risk is if you go through Amazon and you upset Amazon and you are an Alexa home kind of person, your home may be shutting down, right? So just keep that in mind. Because when it ha I think it was Brandon. When it happened to Brandon, I go, oh my God, what happened? He goes, oh yeah, it was horrible. So I mean, he finally cleared it up and everything turned back on. But that's a risk that I'd even think about. So, But normally Amazon's fine. I mean, almost all the gear I buy, I buy on Amazon if it's cheaper. And I've returned a lot of stuff. Like the DJI, the DJI wireless mics, I returned two of those for Amazon. No problems at all. So... Hopefully that answers your question. Doesn't mean it's a guaranteed bueno, but you know, it's not terrible. Is the Q7 gonna be my editor's choice? It looks like, as far as LCD TVs, the QM8 is in the lead. Um, the U8K this year, the, the, the loss of contrast compared to the QM8, and we're, we're talking 1,000, 1,000 to content, and believe me, I played with contrast settings and all these settings to try to get it to be as good as the QM8. The QM8 just innately has better contrast this year for whatever reason, and so that to me is very important. It's very visible, especially dark room watching, and in a bright room, it's just this much brighter than the U8K, although the U8K does have a better processor. I will give the U8K that, but for me, that one scene in Monster Hunter, that is the exception. The other scenes, actually, it's good enough. And I like the gaming bar on the QM8 more. I like that I'm able to adjust the shadow detail in the game bar from 
0 to 9, whereas on the U8K, it's either more shadow or not, right? It's an on-off toggle. And it's easy to find HGIG on the QM8, on-off. So it feels like the gaming bar is just easier to navigate the way I use it, so I like that. So right now, the QM8 is in the lead. The Q7, for value, yes. I cannot make an editor's choice because I'm seeing the Sony doing much better than the Q7. Yes, it's more expensive. But it's not that it's more expensive, but rather the Sony has the less dimming zones, which means that the Q7 could improve its software quite a bit. And But for the price, though, the QM8 is still less expensive than the X90L. So that head-to-head's coming up, but right now the QM8 definitely in the lead, but that's for LCD TVs. For overall, Best TV of this year, editor's choice, it's got to be the S90C, especially the 77-inch. Ah, what a phenomenal TV. As much as I love the S95C, I'm just thinking, wait, the S90C at 77-inch, which I had here for about a month or so, I could not find any scene where the S95C beat it straight up except for full-screen sports SDR, tiny bit brighter. Everything else, boom, exactly the same. And so I'm like, okay, why would I get an S95C other than that one scene, right? Everything else, I mean, Spears and Munsell and HDR. And this is 77 inch. I'm not going to say that the 65 and 55 will give you that same level of equivalence. But if you're looking at a 77 inch, the S90C for the price, and if you guys are AAA members, it was like $28.50. $300 less expensive than the C3 77 inch. It's like LG. You got to lower your price, right? So yeah, the S90C 77 inch right now is in the lead for all around. Just best TV of 2023. And then for LCD TVs, the QM8 this year. I mean, last year it was Hisense, right? You can't win it every year, Hisense, unless there's a firmware update I don't know about. But I think the QM8 with its contrast and black levels, it's going to do very well. All right, let's see. Okay, let's move on. What is next on our list? HDR movies. Oh, wait, you know what? Uh, let's do Dolby Vision next since I, I have the disc up. So we'll do a quick Dolby Vision comparison just to see how dark the Sony is in Dolby Vision. So let me see if there's any more questions and then we'll do a Dolby Vision uh, comparison. Okay. And we will be doing off-angle viewing at the end. And that way, once I move my camera, I don't have to worry about moving it back. We'll just answer questions after that. The TCL QM8 is knocking it out of the park for me. Uh, for what I value, excellent TV. And I'm glad it did because I don't want Hisense to win every year. If TCL wins this year, guess what? Hisense is going to listen to all of our complaints and they'll do better next year. Just like the H9G did really well, but then the year after, well, was it the H9? It was after the H9G. It, it didn't do as well, right? So, you know, you can't win every year. And is there a difference between the 77-inch S90C and the smaller ones? The answer is yes for now. And that difference is... The 55 and 65 inch appears to be using the older panel. Uh, when I say older, I'm saying the one that was on the S95B, the Generation 1 panel. Now, the Generation 1 panel is not that much different from Generation 2. However, Generation 2 has more efficient blue, arguably slightly brighter, and most importantly, twice as durable, whatever that means. But I value that, right? And so on the S90C, which is 77 inch, all 77 inch panels are the same. They are all generation two. Whereas 65 and 55 is gonna be a mix of leftover generation one. So unused generation one that Samsung still has in inventory, they're gonna use it on the S90C until it's all gone. Now, the question is when are they going to start using generation two on the S90C? Who knows, maybe now, right? I mean, some people are saying even the S95B is using generation two possibly. I don't know, but what I do know for certain is 77 inch all use generation two, and that's what I saw as 
my comparison, and so that's why I wanted to limit it to a 77 inch, so that I don't misrepresent the performance of the 65 and 55, just in case it falls a little bit short. So if you guys are in the 77 inch size, you cannot go wrong with the S90C if you're considering the best OLED, period. Like, cost no object. Even the 77 inch A95L, let's see how good it is, right? I know there's a lot of rumors about how bright it's gonna get, but you know, we'll see. We'll see at the shootout. I'm excited about it. All S90, so classy, all S90Cs are software limited to perform the same, which means at any time they could unleash the software to perform better, right? Or they can take the S95C down a notch to make them perform the same. You just don't know. But the good thing is for what we watch, right? Normal people, including myself, if you take Spears and Muscle out of the equation, Netflix, all that stuff, it's all gonna look the same, phenomenal. But yes, if we start pushing it, 10,000 nit content, HDR or 2,000, whatever, there may be some minor differences. So for all intents and purposes, I feel the S95C and the S90C, a 77 inch, identical. So to the degree that software limited though, you know, we're talking like putting the measurement tapes on, it might be very subtle, no doubt. Okay. Here we go. I'll take this question before I jump in. Ken, this is what I'm debating. The 98 inch QM8 or X90L? You gotta go with the QM8. <laughs> because at that size and that many dimming zones, it's going to have phenomenal HDR. But if you're gonna watch full screen content and it's mostly Netflix and you don't care about HDR, then you're gonna get the benefit of the Sony X90L's processor, which I've already seen that the Sony really does a great job with processing low bitrate content and so forth, but it's not gonna give you that pop that I know the QM8 can give you. But then we also know the larger the size, there's some question as to panel lottery and uniformity, so who knows who's gonna get it right. But both are $10,000, and I suspect that they will be about two to $3,000 less a few months after that. So maybe go for the less expensive one, but I think I'm gonna go with the QM898 inch. Not for myself, but for my friends, because I'm helping them renovate their home theater. And we're debating which one, so I still haven't made the last commitment, but I think it's gonna be the QM8. All right, let's get into Dolby Vision real quick. All right, so I'm gonna go into the Panasonic and turn on Dolby Vision. Let's see what happens. And thank you again, everyone, for coming by. Don't forget to click like so more people could enjoy this stream as we are running through the Sony X90L and comparing it with the U8K. Oops. Okay, turning Dolby Vision detection on. Okay, and yes, handshake problems. I'll be right back. Okay, Dolby Vision has been recognized. That's Get it on. And we're, we're gonna put them all on Dolby Vision Dark. Gotta standardize this, right? So here we are, Dolby Vision. So starting with a U8K. Let's make sure we are in Dolby Vision Dark. And yes, we are. Let's make sure light sensor is off. Local dimming is on high. And you cannot touch dynamic tone mapping when you have 
Dolby Vision on. Clarity, okay. All noise reduction is off. All right. Q7. Dolby Vision dark. Advanced settings, brightness. Okay. Looking good. Let's check the Sony. Dolby Vision Dark it is. Everybody is on Dolby Vision Dark. Let's see, let's check this out. And so far the Sony looks great. Doesn't look, now, in real content, we're gonna check The Witcher Netflix Dolby Vision to see, because that's where I saw the biggest differences. But at least with the Spears and Munsell, it, it actually looks pretty good. And if I turn up the exposure, Turn up the exposure, we see that the Sony looks just like the other two TVs. So, at least in this scene, it doesn't feel like the Sony is any darker in this scene. Oh, here's another good one. Yes, there we go. So we are in Dolby Vision 10,000. Yes, let me move this. There we go. Let's get out of the way for you guys. Okay. Actually, move it down. And the Sony looks indistinguishable from the U8K, and the Q7 is not able to hit 10,000 nits, obviously. So the Q7 meets the tone map. Well, it has the Dolby Vision metadata. So the Q7 is doing what it can. And what it can is not as good as if it was at 1,000 nits, right? Whereas the Sony and the U8K is able to incorporate the Dolby Vision metadata very well. And I'd say the U8K, based on the exposure information, maybe is a touch, just a touch brighter in the specular highlights, but then the Sony is a touch darker in the shadow details, so maybe it's a wash. But let's get to the more challenging ones, like the horse. Everyone loves the horse. So here we are. Ah, the horse. Let's move it over. And there we are. And yes, nailed it. Both TVs look great. All the details are there. Identical. Dolby Vision did its job here. So even though it's quote unquote 10,000 nits, because of all that great metadata, all three TVs look great. Actually, the Q7 arguably may have even slightly darker background detail, right? But I'd say all three TVs, they know what to do with Dolby Vision. And this is why. Dolby Vision's there, but then ultimately it looks no different than 1000 in content. So, what's the big deal, right? Now, I wanted to pause here. Actually, I'm going to pause right here. Okay. Remember when the Q7 was a little bit more washed out in? regular HDR. So it appears that it's a bit more improved in Dolby Vision. So this is a case where maybe it helps the Q7 a bit. move to something that puts Dolby Vision to work. Here we go. Excellent one right here. And the Sony looks very much like a U8K. So it feels to me that Dolby Vision kind of pulls back the U8K a bit, but the Sony is able to render it fine. Let me go to a darker area. This is where the Sony looks darker. So let's see if the X90L does that in this scene. Ah, oh, here we go. All 
right. So turning up the exposure to the max, we see that the Sony is not darker than the other two TVs. If anything, arguably it could be slightly lighter, very slightly, but essentially it's not dark. How about that? Although, strange, I lost some color in the Sony. So let me turn out exposure a bit more. So the Sony, the sun in the Sony is this circle of yellow with no color inside it at all. It's just uniform yellow, which is wrong. There is haze inside or covering the sun, right? It's like a haze, clouds, whatever. The haze is on the U8K. The haze is just barely there on the Q7. And there is no haze at all on the Sony. So this is one where the Sony, you're, you've actually lost color information. And so as a comparison, let me bring it down to 1000 nits. So we can double check. Actually, let's make it easy, 600 nits. We know they can do 600 nits, right? If the handshake allows. Ah, yes, here we are. Okay. And, yep, it's there. So in 10,000 nit, Dolby Vision, the, the Sony actually loses some detail, so which is kind of ironic. Yeah, there's a bit more information there that was not there at 10,000 nit. So I think this kind of gives us an idea, at least, that in most scenes, like this one, so I'm going to do Dolby Vision again, because this is an important scene to see if there's any crushed blacks or dark Dolby Vision. Remember, all three TVs are in Dolby Vision dark. And this is a scene where if one TV is a little bit darker than the other, you're going to see it because you have dark areas, bright areas, everything in between. Oh, this one too, but this one's better. Okay. All right, let me turn it up. So here we are. The, so we know the Q7 Dolby Vision is actually pretty good, very similar to QM8. And we know the U8K is a touch lifted in the shadow areas, which it is right now. The Sony looks very similar to the Q7. And this tells me that at least it's not dark like it used to be. So I'm thinking the Dolby Vision dark in Spears and Muscle looks pretty good. So we'll see how it goes with streaming content. And we're gonna do that. Let's see, are we doing that next? I think we're done with Dolby Vision and Spears and Muscle. Oh, uh, you know what? Let's go to streaming. Let's go to Adobe Vision streaming, since we're here anyway. So, but let me get to questions while we're taking a break here. So, Adobe Vision on the Sony, at Spears on Spears, at least on Spears and Muscle, Adobe Vision Dark looks fine. <laughs> Rob, this is such a... But this question blows my mind mostly because the TVs are so different. So thank you for the super chat. Should I buy Sony X90L or the Z9K? So the Z9K comes in only two sizes, right? The 75 and the 85. Okay. 
So I'm assuming you're looking at the 85X90L. The Z9K is so much brighter, it's not even funny. And the Z9K has more dimming zones. So if you don't want the Z9K to bloom, just take around brightness just a little bit, or you know, you can play with it and it's gonna control the blooming a little bit. But if you have low bitrate content, the X90L with XR Clear, arguably, maybe better. So what is your use case? If you're in a bright room, you're watching bright sports, then the Z9K is just so bright. It's just so in a bright room, Z9K is perfect, right? Floor to ceiling windows, you're watching in standard mode, whatever, and you need that extra pop. X90L does not have that. I mean, in some of these, at 1000 nits, it's fine because the Z9K shouldn't be brighter at 1000 nits, but we're talking SDR sports, or you're watching hockey, you're in a bright room, you need that extra luminance, the Z9K will deliver. And the Z9K is pushing performance for movies like Mad Max or Aquaman, right? But if you're watching HDR streaming, everything is a thousand nits or less. Save money, get the X90L, it's gonna look great, especially in a brighter room, whatever, right? So it's so hard for me to recommend the Z9K unless I know for sure you want that brightness. Because the Z9K, you're paying for this extra, it's just so overpowered. Look at the energy the energy rating for the, X, for the Z9K, you'll see how much power it consumes. Maybe it should be the X90L or the X95L. I think the X95L is gonna, it, that is also more sophisticated than the Z9K. Okay. Oh, look. Our friend, the Spears and Muscle Frog is here. I really need a 120 inch TV to be happy. <laughs> we are three years away from that. I've already seen the 110 inch, right? So you, if we have a 110 inch, there's a 110 inch 8K TV, the Hisense UX. It's being sold in China exclusively this year, but that means a 120 inch is around the corner. So if they could get the 110 inch over here, Sorry, I just had to get the exposure a little bit better. So the 110 inch in China, the Hisense UX, and I know TCL has 110 inches out there as well. The question is, is there a large enough market in the US for a 110 inch at $6,000, at 8,000? I mean, where is that price point where they can sell it in volume? It's not worth it for them to send 500 of these to the US. They wanna sell thousands of them, right? So let me ask you guys, if there are 110 inch and 120 inch TVs, how much would it have to cost or how inexpensive would it have to be for you to consider it? Under $10,000, under $5,000, you would never consider a 120 inch or 110 inch. Personally, I think 85 inch is too small now. I would like to see more 98 inch and 110 inch is great. 120 might be a little bulky. I don't know about carrying it up. It's never gonna come off the wall, I'll tell you that. Okay, let's see what else we got here. If no more questions, we're gonna jump into streaming. And good follow-up here, Frog. Back in my day, it was like a 27-inch from eight feet away, right? I noticed that I watch at a 40 to 3 degree viewing angle. And a 40 to 43 viewing angle is like eight feet from an 85-inch, seven feet from a 77-inch, right? It's, it's an easy one-to-one -one match. 10 feet from a 100-inch. I find that to be comfortable. Now, I might not go any larger than the 40 to 43 degree viewing angle. So for me, if I'm sitting 10 feet away, I really do want a 100 to 110 inch myself. And so 98 inch is also where I'm at, where I'm at because I tend to sit around 10 to 11 feet away from the TV because I want just enough distance to put speakers and stuff like that, which is around 10 feet, right? And which means at least a 110, 100 inch TV. 
but a lot of people are shocked. Oh my gosh, it's so big. You go, you know, once you get used to it, you can't go back. It's just like OLED. All right, let's do streaming. I'll be right back. There we go. Wrong one. Here we are, HDR. Let's let's see some scenes in HDR. Then we're gonna move them to Dolby Vision and we'll see the differences, right? Let's see, let's see if it's what we think it will be. I, I really like this scene. Okay, this is HDR, and I think all the TVs are in the right mode. Let's double check. Yep, full micro mode. Movie mode, and the Sony should be in custom. Yep, okay. I get the most pop from the fire in the bottom right-hand corner from the U8K. So U8K, just streaming HDR, it gives you that extra pop, and the sh but it's slightly the shadow detail, that back door, slightly more lifted than the Sony, yeah. Okay, so raise the exposure a bit so you guys can see the differences. Although the UAK pops a bit more, the fires and everything, there's a price to be paid everything is slightly brighter. So the dynamic range and the contrast isn't preserved as well. Actually, it's surprising. The Q7 and the X90L look very similar. And this is what I tell people. If you're just streaming regular content, get the Q7 because the Q7 looks great. It, what is your source? And Netflix streaming, Q7 looks fine, right? So let's go to this next scene. Oop, swearing. I don't want to get canceled. For, oop. Okay, so let me lower the exposure. Okay. The U8K, even in this content, although it's HDR, the shadow just feels slightly lifted across the board. In a vacuum, it looks fine. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
but next to the Sony and the Q7, it feels like that shadow detail just a little bit more, right? I mean, it's subtle, but it's there. And this is one where if you're streaming regular content, again, the Q7, you're saving a lot of money by going there for sure. And the U7K is similar. So the U8K really, it's like this high performing disc where it's like super bright. And the QM8 does that really well because even in this scene, do you need the extra brightness of the QM8? Probably unlikely. Okay, Q7 and Sony, very similar. Oh, wait, this is not Dolby Vision. For those of you who are just <laughs> watching, now that we have something to compare it to, let's go to Dolby Vision. So we're gonna go through the same scenes again, but we're gonna have it in Dolby Vision shortly. All right, Dolby Vision is on. Okay. All right, this goes back to Netflix. And there you see, does it say Dolby Vision? No, I'm gonna get out, try it again. There it is. Okay, Dolby Vision is recognized. So we are in Dolby Vision. So let's try this again. Let's see what happens in Dolby Vision. Okay, wow. The UAK lifted even farther. So this is why I was saying on the UAK, Dolby Vision is far, <laughs> it's just too lifted. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm going to have to tell Hisense now that I've had a chance to to check different content. You notice on the Spears and Munsell, Dolby Vision, looks fine, right? But here, let me make sure that it's Dolby Vision Dark still. Yep, Dolby Vision Dark. Um, it's just too lifted. The Q7, fine. The Sony X90L, a uh, touch darker. Let me turn up the exposure, you guys can see. So uh, the Sony, the Q7 and the Sony, very similar. You could argue that the Sony X90L is slightly darker, but it's side by side, they're just very similar. But it's clear that the U8K Dolby Vision is just too bright. Then this is Dolby Vision dark, right? So let's go to the next scene. <laughs> Here we go again. I'm gonna get canned, I tell you. Oh. Okay, so same here, right? Oh, uh, this is actually a pretty good scene in Dolby Vision. Um, so the Sony, I could say, in this scene, the Sony isn't darker at all. And so I believe Sony probably addressed their dark Dolby Vision issue because it looks pretty good and it's not darker than the HDR. You guys saw it in HDR, right? So, you know, rewind back a few minutes. And it looks like Dolby Vision dark is very near equivalent to HDR, which takes us to the question, does it matter if you're in Dolby Vision? Now, maybe, many of you are saying, wait, you know, maybe it's the content, right? So, yeah, maybe it is. So let's see, what content would it be? So remember this, same thing, it looks great, Dolby Vision or HDR, but the UAK definitely not recommended. Just do not use Dolby Vision. The problem is if you're using internal app on a U8K, does it look like this? I haven't tested it, but it wouldn't surprise me if it did. This is the external streamer, the Chromecast, uh, Google TV. So 
Sony Q7 looks fine. Now, let's try Sweet Tooth and see what that's like in Dolby Vision. I have just the thing. I really like this scene that I've been using. Oh yeah, right here. Okay, so this is super bright. Okay, in Sweet Tooth, the UAK is still a touch lifted. Now this thing is so bright, it's hard to see that it's a touch lifted. What I wanted to see is whether the Sony renders the scene dark, and it doesn't, right? So let's go, how about this one right here? This scene potentially could be a dark scene that the Sony struggles with, and it doesn't. Oh, wow, Dolby Vision looks fine. UAK, not so much. We are going to turn off HDR though, so you guys can compare. But this actually looks pretty good. Now, because it uses black bars, let me turn up the exposure to see if it's noticeable. And yeah, I can tell you it's pretty noticeable. So the Sony has never cared about black bars. And even without turning up the exposure, that's why I turned it up. I, I noticed it here. For some of you, it may not be a distraction. And my studio is fairly dark. So for me, it is a distraction. Based on this, if I only watch full screen content, I would not hesitate to get the Sony X90L. But because I watch a lot of content, Netflix, for example, that does have content that has black bars. The Q7 would be my choice because the black bar is a distraction to me. But arguably, the Sony does the little things better, not including the black bars. And the U8K has less of the blooming black bars. But because it's Dolby Vision, this entire scene is just a mess on a U8K. It should not be this lifted, right? So I know I'm hammering it because I know Hisense is watching and they're like, ah, we gotta figure this out. So I'm gonna go to HDR10 now and then, you know, let's see what happens. Hope you guys are enjoying this stream. Don't forget to click like, my friends, because it's a great way to get people to watch and enjoy more about the TVs than they ever expected to know. Maybe too much. Okay. We're back in HDR. Adobe Vision is off. And There we go. Dolby Vision is off. Okay. So, get us back to Netflix. Resume. Yep, Dolby Vision is off. Stop right here. Oh, let's go back a little bit. And here we go. Already, we can see it's brighter because I didn't change the exposure. Dolby Vision, well, actually, you know what? Let me change the exposure down and see. So first of all, the black the black bars are there. Exposure is elevated. Let me turn on exposure. Wait, what happened? Why is it so bright? All right, let's see. Okay. And making sure, all right, that's about right. 
I mean, did Dolby Vision do any better? It looks the same to me. I mean, I'm sure subtly there are subtle changes, right? But the scene is preserved. And we'll get to that bright scene here. Okay. So, UAK clearly looks better. The Sony is a little bit brighter than the Q7. It is allowing more, or it's doing a better job of preserving the scene because the brightness and the dynamic contrast, the dynamic range is there. I'm going to look at this scene again to see if the U8K is raised in HDR and is definitely less raised. Um, definitely. So, Dolby Vision. But the contrast falls short of the Sony. So, I cannot wait for my QM8 to be replaced. The QM8 is going to be a killer TV compared to the Sony X90L. So let's go on. I think streaming, while we're here, any questions, we can address it right now. I think the Sony X90L so far is doing well. Unfortunately, it's $1,500 or 1400 something. That's just so much for what you're getting. I, I wish it would, well, it should be 1100 which it will be next year, this time. So at 1100 I can see it. 1500 is just too much. All right, let me see any questions. If not, we'll move on to the next comparison. Thank you, Lisa. Please smash that like button. All right. If you have any questions, just keep on throwing them out there. I'll try to jump in every now and then. And KG, I agree. The 85 inch Q90B. It's a great TV. Q90B and the Q85B at 85 inches sold out. Also, a great deal for like 300 less, but it's not available. Q90B, $2,300. I, I would jump on it in a heart because a lot of people are saying, wait, QM8 or Q90B? The reality is the Q90B has really good processing. Oh, HDR Movies is next. We're going to see how the Sony does with that very challenging Monster Hunter. I really want to see how they do in that one. So uh, let's do that next. So HDR Movies is up. Boom. All right, time to fire up the Kaleidoscape. And I'll answer this. Uh, Frog, my friend, is the TCL accurate enough to compare to the Sony in terms of colors out of the box? Unlikely. Out of the box, the TCL pushes a little bit red. Even after calibration, it pushes a little bit red. The Sony actually looked pretty good. And so when we kind of did the, the whole skin tone and everything, the Q7 was calibrated and the Sony looked fine. It looked very similar to the U8K, uncalibrated. Uh, it doesn't have that extra bit of, I mean, it's just a touch of green that's on the U8K out of the box. The Sony didn't have that. I think the colors on the Sony look phenomenal. The only thing is that the X90L not recommended if you have black bars, like right here. I could see it. I keep on seeing it. But if you have full screen content, X90L is a great TV. So cable, just regular everyday movies, Seinfeld, whatever. It's, it's great. It's fine. All right. So let's go to movies. I'll be right back. Okay, Monster Hunter live stream. These were carefully curated to avoid YouTube censorship. <laughs> and they were timed in a certain way so that I don't get hit. Been lucky so far, right? Aquaman, no, it wasn't. What was it? Was it Aquaman? I think it was Aquaman. They refused to lift the copyright. I actually had to remove it. So that's why there's no more Aquaman on my live stream.
What? Okay, let's try this again. Okay. I'm just adjusting the exposure right now. All right, so clearly the U8K is a bit brighter. Then comes the Sony, but the Sony has really good contrast. The Q7, less bright, and the contrast is slightly worse. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, nailed that one. Okay, let's see. <sighs> Sony is really doing well in this scene. Q7 is as expected. So this is in a movie, the Sony with less dimming zones. And even though there are black bars in this movie, it's not as obvious. So definitely it's content dependent. As you saw in Netflix, that black bar was all over the place. In this movie, the black bar is actually pretty good. I'm going to raise the exposure so you guys can see. How is it, in a scene that's this bright, the Sony black bars are less noticeable? Yeah. I thought it was my camera exposure not bright enough, but this... So it definitely is content dependent. I think Sony is almost there. They know how to get rid of the black bars. Let me move this back down again. But just sometimes it's not consistent. All right, let's go on to the next one. Ah, there we go. Okay. And again, not terrible black bars, better than years before. Could be better. I can see it, but it's not as obvious as was on the Netflix. But let's just look at the other stuff. So colors, contrast is phenomenal, by the way. Uh, the, the pants are actually, I mean, just everything. The pants, the shirt, the jacket, the gold, contrast is really good. So as is the Q7. And also, let me turn down the exposure so we can talk about the peak spectral highlights. Okay, in the flames on the top right-hand corner, the Sony has better contrast than the TCL Q7. The UAK obviously is a touch brighter here or there, but I really enjoy that the Sony is doing a great job with its, just the overall contrast this scene is really good. Very, by, by the way, they all look so similar. If I didn't have them side by side, I wouldn't be able to compare, but it just feels like the dynamic range on the Sony in this scene is really, really good. Definitely excellent. Oh, her red suit looks great in this scene. I'm going to turn up the exposure so you can see how deep that red is.
Okay. What do you guys think? Sony looks great in the scene. Nah, I know the black bars, but we just took that out. Sony, you're killing me. Oh, so if you take black bars into consideration, the, the Q7 is better, but if you don't look at the black bars, I think the Sony did this scene very well. And, and this is what kills me is in a full screen content, the X90L is an amazing TV, but you, you cannot ignore the black bars, right? Because I do see it. I don't have to trap the exposure to see it. I see it right here. But everything else about the image processing in this scene is very well done. The contrast, the color depth, and the Q7, by the way, actually wins the scene because it does both with the black bars. All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, we're going to compare brightness. Which TV can get as bright as a U8K? All right, here we go. And the UAK and the, and the Sony, about similar brightness. The Q7 is just a step behind, but this is why you get an LCD TV, right? Is for this brightness. OLEDs have a hard time getting up here without heat sinks and everything like that. So no issues. Go on to the next one. Oh, Mad Max. Here we go. You know what to look for. And I'm gonna wait, wait, wait for it. There we go, okay. So, if you look at where the speakers are to his right and his jacket, the depth of color, the richness of the red, and remember the Q7 is calibrated, the X90L is not, and the U8K is not. This is not a calibration issue, and it's not really a color saturation issue. I think it's just the Sony, the Sony really just out of the box. This looks really good. This is how much color there is in this scene. And I had to overexpose it for you guys to see what I see. It's really good. So the black levels are great. And I'm trying to ignore the black bars. <laughs> I know it's like, Sony, please. But everything in between, and this is where the Q7, its value really comes out is, look how well the Q7 does in comparing itself to the Sony, yet the black bars are much less noticeable. So for me, this is a win for the Q7 at half the price of the Sony, almost half, right? So the Sony is 1400 and change. The TCL Q7, $850. And the U8K, 1300, 1200 around there. The Q7 HDR movie so far is impressing me greatly for what you're paying for. So like many of you are saying, you know, is, is Q7 the editor's choice? It's definitely my value for under a thousand dollars. The QM8 is the Q7 and more. And that's why the QM7 or the QM8 is gonna be my LCD editor's choice. And the Sony is 1450 or 14 whatever. It better perform this well. And I think the black bars is this compromise, but still, you know, this Sony being Sony, I, I, I love it. Except for the black bars. All right, let's go to this next scene. Let's see what we got here. Oh yeah. Oh, great scene. All right, what do we got here? So the Q7 
clipping the details. It's not brighter. It's just that detail isn't there. So this is, and it's dynamic tone mapping is on, by the way. So in the brightest part of the clouds behind him, you see that the Q7, it just doesn't have any of that detail. And it has nothing to do with exposure. It's just not there. It is there on the Sony and the UAK. Now, the UAK, it better be there. It's got over a thousand dimming zones. For it to be there on the Sony while also matching the brightness of the UAK, this is a win for the Sony because it looks great with one tenth dimming zones. So, definitely bravo, Sony, in this scene. Getting that bright, controlling, I mean, I expect it to be like the Q7, basically just clipping that detail, and it isn't. It's great. So, yes, I'll, I'll give, you know, let's, let's see if dynamic tone mapping in this scene, turning it off would help because that does bother me that normally I have it on, but maybe it'll help if I turn it off. So let's see. Oh, it's even worse. So leave dynamic tone mapping on, on the Q7. It did not help by turning it off. I, I just had to see, right? Curiosity being what it is, but yeah, you got to leave dynamic tone mapping on. Okay, so the, the Sony did a great job here. Good job, Sony. Software, minimal dimming zones, yet matching the U8K. And this is a really hard scene. It's bright, it's got black levels, and its contrast is better than the U8K. So I'm gonna increase exposure so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so as you can see, although the UAK gets brighter, below his chin, it should be slightly darker. Sony has that darkness. Q7 has that darkness. But Sony has both the black levels and that specular highlight that's fully defined. The UAK can only do one of the two, basically getting that brightness and all that stuff. But the, And by the way, they could fix this. Having more dimming zones doesn't make it lifted. It's just they did not properly optimize their tone mapping for any of the scenes. Everything in the shadow is just slightly lifted. And would calibration help? Possibly. Possibly. But since Sony is out of the box, it's apples to apples, isn't it? The Sony, so the Q7 is calibrated. The Sony, not calibrated. The UAK, not calibrated. So you can say that this is apples to apples. Sony X90L uncalibrated against the UAK uncalibrated. The Q7 representing calibration, the Sony is more similar to the Q7 and more. So again, Sony, please, let's do something with that black bar. But very good, very good, what they did here. I'm very impressed, by the way. I have not seen this in prior Sonys. Because brightness normally is a challenge for them with the specular highlights. So, uh, it's just expense. $14.99. <laughs> okay, this scene, very difficult for older TVs uh, because you have to preserve brightness in the scene and then super bright in the fluorescent lights. The question is, which TV can preserve that extreme? Right here. All right. So... How do we know this? I'm going to see if I'm going to turn up the exposure. So the brightness of the fluorescent lights, it feels like all the TVs are there. Turning down the exposure. Wow, all three TVs does, does this job phenomenally. This is normally a, a test for OLED. And by the way, the G3 passed the flying colors. So nothing to see here. Let's move on. Oh, pan. This is going to be a shocker for you guys. I, I cheated and, and ran this scene earlier, and I was so impressed by the results. Here we go. And actually right there. Okay.
Okay, so let's start with that sun. We know that the QM8, the Q7, and the U8K was unable to resolve all the detail in that sun simply because it's just so bright and mini LED TVs, LCD TVs, full ray local dimming being what it is, everything is slightly bright. It's so hard to control it. So selfie emissive OLED is able to perfectly control it. The Sony X90L looks so similar to the G3 right here. It's unbelievable. And the question is, oh, well, is it as bright? Yeah. It, now, I know it's moving and everything, but I'm just going to have to sit here and just be impressed by the overall performance of the Sony. That sun, I normally see it like that only on OLED TVs. And for Sony to do that, with the number of dimming zones it has, I have to give props where it's due. This is really impressive. Okay, so going up the other way, right? As you can see, the U8K, it's just, the, the details aren't there. The Sony is preserving so much of the contrast and everything in this scene. And so at the end of the day, this is a very difficult scene. 4,000 nits at its brightest point, supposedly. And the Sony is really managing the scene well. So the software this year, could be the best I've ever seen from Sony. It's just having so few dimming zones, you know, slightly lifted black bars. But I think finally, Sony's reputation for software this year, they probably earned it, no doubt. All right, let's move on. I think the next one's gonna be the very difficult Monster Hunter scene. Ah, here we go. I'm gonna do a one run through to check my exposure. I think I have it right. Yes, artifacts are still there on the Q7 and not on the Sony or the U8K. I'm going to have to really examine this, but it's very close to the U8K. I mean, isn't that funny that we're actually comparing the Sony to a, a Hisense processor? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through this 120 FPS, and then slow it down and do a frame-by-frame -frame examination. But it looks like the Sony is not struggling the same way that the, U, that the Q7 and the QM8 struggled in the scene. Very close to the U8K. So, you know, I'm going to pause right here real quick. You know what? I'll pause on the next one. Oh, maybe not. Let's check this one. Waiting, waiting, and right. Okay, good enough. What I'm looking for is, so it's bright scenes. How is the shadow detail right outside that bright flash? Is it well-defined? And this is just to see the processing, what kind of information is there? Are they able to do it? And the Sony looks just like the other TVs.
Okay, so I took down the exposure all the way so you guys can see that brightness is very similar. I mean, short of getting a meter out, but just it, my subjective visual impact. Looks the same. And turning up the exposure a bit, black levels are very similar. So nothing wrong here. The only issue is the right there where the explosion is, the left side is a vertical black bar. So if you find that distracting, keep that in mind. This, again, is the weakness of the Sony right now. The Q7, slightly there, and even the U8K, because this is so bright, has a bit of it there as well. Now, to turn up the exposure to see it, but so... In regular exposure, it's harder to see. Sony is still the most obvious, but this is hard because this is super bright explosion right next to a black bar. So this is why you get an OLED, is to avoid that black bar if it is a distraction to you. I think we're done with the movies now. So let's jump to questions. All right, let's see what you guys got here. Thanks for putting up with all this. Just trying to capture and get a feel for the Sony. I think you guys have an idea what the Sony can do, right? Let me see. I think we'll do upscaling of DVD next and then off angle last. I think we have almost everything. Okay, if there are no questions, let us go to upscaling of DVD content. Let's put that down here. Boom. Okay, once again, we are using Dog's Purpose because that's the only one I have in 480p DVD. No, I'm going to turn off my camera so I don't get hit. Okay, so while it's playing through the mandatory, <laughs> the mandatory previews, uh, these previews are terrible. Any questions, let me know. What? Caleb was here? I missed it too. <laughs> I was like too busy with you guys or too busy with my content. Uh, almost there. I'm going to find a scene and we'll, we'll compare it. Almost there.
Okay, just looking for a scene. Okay, I think I found one. Okay, other than UAK being a little bit bright since it's not calibrated for SDR, I'm just looking at resolution and all three TVs look fine. However, because it is a upscaling thing, let's see if I can do some super scaling stuff if they have that option. Okay, go into clarity on the Sony. So I'm turning all the noise reduction on high, just to see. I'm going to turn smooth gradation to low. Actually, it doesn't make a big difference, but I'm going to keep it on low. All right, just to see. But ultimately, it looks very similar. It's, there's no big step up in 480p upscaling to me. I think it looks very similar to the Q7. Turn up the exposure a bit. I'm going to turn down the brightness on. Whoops, on the U8K. It's just way too bright in SDR. Oh, maybe because local dimming is on medium. Uh, let's turn this down. Ah, close enough. Okay, so now it's a little bit more apples to apples. Still a little bit bright, but that's you know what I'll do a little bit more. Take it down to forty. Okay, that should do it. Okay, close enough. So. Okay. If you're watching DVDs, all three TVs are fine with DVDs, I think. The UAK is a bit contrasty. Um, maybe it's just used to HDR. So the Q7 and the, and the X90L look very similar in terms of its consistency of contrast and all that stuff. So I'd say Q7 actually a pretty good TV. I mean, by the end of this, my preference is for the Q7 for the price. I really like that TV for the price. You saw its weaknesses, extreme HDR, but if you're just streaming where your content, the Q7 really has done a great job. So I 
think we're done with that. Let's get back to the spirits and muscle disc and we'll go off angle and then we'll be done. So we'll do some off angle. Check for questions real quick. Not only are they a pain, it's not even worth doing unless it's sports, right? The only SDR, because it doesn't matter about calibrating colors, is sports, brightness, clarity, turn everything on, right? Smooth gradation, just turn it all on and see how good it looks in sports. Because it's so subjective. Can I see the score, right? Yeah, I would not do SDR quality. That's, uh, that's for classy and, and those cinema enthusiasts I am. HDR movies all day long. Okay. Hisense overexposed. The, the whole camera is overexposed. The Hisense is on brightness 40, and it's still very bright. That, it's just a very bright TV. So we're going to do something a little different for off angle. The content I'm going to use this time is still Spears and Munsell, but skin tones. I think you guys will notice color shifts more in a skin tone change than anything else, right? So <laughs> if you look at a peacock or whatever colorful animal that's on Spears and Munsell, going off angle, you're not going to notice it as much. I mean, oh, is that fuchsia or is it a light fuchsia but skin tones oh my gosh you went from yellow to green right so we're going to try off angle skin tones because you'll notice how unnatural it is right away so i'm going to do a let's see we're in dolby vision well it'll be dolby vision i don't think it really matters actually it does matter the ua kit does not do well in dolby vision so let me turn off dolby vision Right. How's everyone doing on Saturday? We're almost done. You know, you know what I love about these streams? By the time I'm done, you and I both know the TV so well. So those who catch the stream like, Shh, I know it all. Other than firmware updates that might change our conclusions. All right, so let's do some skin tone magic my friends i'm adjusting the brightness a bit Okay, you know what, I'm going to take it up one notch. I want to make sure that the skin tones are obvious to you guys. Okay. I'm going to look for that matrix where they're all standing together. And then we'll do some skin uh, off angle with, okay, this one, actually I'm gonna take exposure down a touch. I think this is a good one because she has a slight tan. Okay, well, you know what? Uh, yeah, we'll try it, let's see what happens. Let me see if you guys have any questions. So let's do off angle. Okay. 
This is what it looks like on angle. Let's see what it looks like off angle. Okay, then let's make some minor adjustments to my zoom here. Okay, this is hard, mostly because the color shift on all of them is pretty terrible. <laughs> so maybe what I'm going to do is put it on and then slowly move it, and hopefully you guys don't get dizzy, because off angle, I mean, it's everything the way the angle of the camera is, I'm going to have to move it slowly. So we'll see what happens. You guys tell me what you think. But ultimately, the U8K and the Sony and the Q7... If you need off angle, you really got to get an OLED, but we'll try. Okay, so subjectively, the U8K has the worst off angle. The Q7 and the Sony are very close. Not to say that they're great, but they're better than the U8K. U8K and I can see why high sense that everyone is going to an ADS panel because just moving a little bit, you can see the color shift. But on the Q7 and the Sony, they preserve a little bit more saturation, but then at some point you lose it, right? So that is the off angle. And let me get this back in again, play with the zoom. Okay. Hopefully, let's see what questions you guys got. I think we're done. Let me see if there's anything else I need to do. In the meantime, Let's get us to three by three matrix. Why not? Enjoy all the models. Okay. Let's see what question you guys got and then we'll be done. <laughs> Off angle was flattering. <laughs> for the model or for the TV?
ADS panels when calibrated fixes a lot of issues with, you know, let me take this off so you guys can read this better. And let me make myself smaller so I can make your comments more visible. Here we go. Okay, thank you for the question or the comment, Miyako Best Girl. ADS panels when calibrated fixes a lot of issues with motion and angles, but it causes issues with blooming, especially on corners. We're getting close to fixing all of that. I, I really think it's just a matter of sophistication because what it fixes is, is impossible to address on a VA panel, but the issues it causes can be addressed with like blooming more dimming zones, right? Better software control. For example, I found the QN85B last year to be better than the QN90B in many instances, especially in just on, just on axis, it actually looked better. Off axis, it definitely looked better. And the only issue was slight blooming of bright content as we talked about, but you can address that. And I think it's just a matter of time because the QN85B what if it had 1400 dimming zones, like the QN95C, right? Would that have addressed it? So I think we're almost there. And also keep in mind this, everyone is sourcing their best backlighting system from BOE right now. BOE, their LCD that people are buying, their top of the line is the ADS Pro, which is an IPS type panel. That's their most expensive one, right? At the display week, their best technology was ADS Pro. This is their best technology, and they're preferring to make this over the VA panel because they're pushing the limits of what they think LCD TVs can do, and they feel it's an ADS Pro. And you know, this is their second year doing it as far as the big makers are sourcing from BOE, and I suspect next year, the year after, ADS is just going to be a good standard that will give OLED a run for its money, especially if brightness is important to you. Okay, let's see what else we got here. So what's the story in the X93L? Sony this year, is every size using the same panel as last year? Yes. So the X93L is just the X95K, essentially. Um, maybe software improvements. It doesn't even have the XR clear that all the other TV has. It essentially is a repackaged X95K. So if you're looking at the X93L, Get the X95K if it's available in that size at a discount first because you're really getting last year's TV. End of story. And if, you're, if it's not the X95K, save some money, then just wait and upgrade to an 85-inch X95L. I'm very disappointed with what they did with the X93L. Just, it's unfortunate, but that's what it is. Hey, Michael, I know you love that VA panel, but the future is ADS. Hey, KG, FOMO, what is your overall final impression of the three taking price into consideration? $850, no doubt about it, the Q7. That's it. End of story, right? If, if you want, let's say, let's say your budget is $800. I cannot imagine any TV that's better than the Q7 for that price. The U7K falls behind the Q7. More dimming zones, but more blooming, worse contrast. Dolby Vision is lifted, just like on the QM8, or I'm sorry, just like on the U8K. The Q7, Dolby Vision, looks good. Its contrast for what it is looks good, and it's, it's a really good TV. Now, my disappointment is this. The Sony X90L is better than the Q7. All the subtle things, it does better. It does tone mapping of hard content better. It has better image processing, but it's 1400 plus, right? 14 something. <sighs> I can't justify that because for less, you have the QM8. Now, granted the QM8 processing is not there. So this is the question. If you guys have high quality content, you know, YouTube TV, whatever, most of the time, the QM8 fits the bill. But as you saw in Monster Hunter, the QM8 struggles with that. It's that weird artifacts that it struggled with. Gaming, is it gonna happen in certain gaming content? I don't know. So it's like, you can't have everything because the Sony X90L, for me, it's a deal breaker. Black bars, 
that's a deal breaker because most movies, even Netflix, has black bars. And as you saw, it's very obvious. And for me, it's kind of a distraction. I'm used to OLED. But if I was forced not to get an OLED, like get an LCD TV, of the three, well, the QM8 isn't here. UAK, but not Dolby Vision, right? And I don't watch Dolby Vision anyway. So UAK, not Dolby Vision. But if Dolby Vision is a must, Q7 or the Sony X90L. And that's another pleasant surprise. It appears that Sony X90L has addressed the Dolby Vision dark, dark problem. It's just accurate now, very similar to Q7. So for under 800, Q7 still. For over a thousand, me personally, if cost was a thing, I could tell you that my family would make me choose the Sony because the colors on the Sony out of the box, the gradient and everything, they probably would choose the Sony X90L. They would not notice the black bars. It's just, I notice it. It's funny, they never notice it. I'm like, hey, do you see the black bars? What are you talking about? What's the black bar? So <laughs> maybe it's just me. I think the Sony X90L, even though it's $1499, the things it does well, it does well. And I would choose the UAK because of the black bars. Wife and kids will probably choose the Sony X90L. So I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, they're a few hundred dollars off. And to me, I mean, I would actually get the 65 inch G3, S95C, S90C before I get any of these, but since those are so expensive, if you were to keep me under 1500, I would, well, since the QM8 is not in consideration, but I would choose the QM8 because we know it's in consideration. Thanks for that question. All right, let's see what else we got here. And I'm almost done, Noah. Oh my God, you're still going? Almost done. Actually, I'm done. We're just answering questions, but I think we're pretty much done. This is my mantra. There's always next year. This is me and the Apple Watch. I think someone said to me that I'm like David Whelan with the Apple Watch. I always tell myself, I'm going to get an Apple Watch. And then I find out there's something better. And so I haven't got my Apple Watch yet, even though I'm like a fitness geek. And I need the Apple Watch. Ah, oh, but micro LED is coming in two years. Oh, is there a glucose monitor? And so I end up with no watch. And in the meantime, my son's already gone through two Apple Watches. And my daughter has one. I still don't have one. So it's real. The FOMO is real. 1400 for the X90L? More. It's like 1450, 1499. It's not worth that much. I would say wait till Black Friday. Yes, the Sony is great, but you know by Black Friday, it'll probably be under 1300, so don't don't pay 14 whatever for it. It is way too much. How is the Q7 compared to the TCL 6 series of last year? The 6 series is just brighter, deeper black bars. The 6 series has more dimming zones. The 6 Series really is better than the Q7. However, the Q7 is, I think, a natural successor to the original 6 Series, right? The one from 2019. So the Q7 and the 6 Series of 2019 before Mini LED, those two are a good evolutionary jump. Last year's 6 Series jumped to the QM8. So the QM8, both in terms of price, specs, and performance, is the natural evolution of last year's 6 Series and the year before. But the Q7 is where the original 6 Series was from 2019 and 2020, if that makes sense. And thank you, Michael. I enjoyed this stream. All right, Noah. 75-inch Q7 or 65-inch QM8 in a basement with some windows. Hmm. If you're mostly streaming on sports, get the Q7 larger size. I think you'd appreciate the immersion from the larger size. When we start pixel peeping, we kind of get in the woods on the things that you may not even see. So given that they're both TCL and they have the same processor, it feels to me that the Q7 extra size makes up for the few shortcomings, which is the uh, tone mapping of super bright content, which you will rarely see. So. I'd say go for the 75-inch Q7. I, I think consistently it impressed me for what it was able to do. And the larger size will be even more impressive. F 
families always make you choose the Sony. You know what's funny is my wife can tell when it's a Sony. I'm like, which you like better? I had the S ninety, I had the S ninety five C up, and I had the Sony A ninety five K, and I'm like, you know, and the other one's a bigger TV. I'm like, okay, which one do you like? like? Without a second thought, I like this one. She didn't know what it was. Like, it's, it's the Sony A ninety five K. Okay, I like that one. Bring that one home. So that one's they got home now. I was hoping to bring the S ninety five C seventy seven inch. No, no, I like this one better. So. I think naturally Sony knows what it's doing, at least with the ladies, right? So maybe this is why Lisa has a bunch of Sonys, right, Lisa? Come on. And catch you later, later, Leo. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Love you, love you. All right, I think we're almost done here. Just making sure I'm not missing any questions. And thank you, everyone, if you came by. And if there is a super chat I missed, just ask it now. Good question. FOMO, because people at Hisense do watch your videos, and we know they do, right? Do you think they will fix the issues? So it's, it's, it's always priorities. I will tell you this. They specifically addressed the 4K 120 issue last year with gamers, and, and they really did it this year. I saw it. It looks great. But now they need to fit. And the processing, again, complaints about that red ghosting addressed, right? I mean, really addressed. Image processing is phenomenal. Now they just need to address, they need to, to, out of the box from the factory, get that near back calibrated so it's a bit darker. It's just too lifted. It's a bit washed out. So I think they can do that out of the factory. I think it's a software thing because it has more than enough dimming zones for sure. U7K has the same problem as the U8K. So I'm hoping they didn't just move the U7K to the U8K and not worry about it. But my hope is they will address it. And I do have a direct email to Hisense, and I tell them, hey, these are my findings, and so they look into it. But Dolby Vision hasn't been addressed yet. So, you know, sometimes they listen, and sometimes certain things are just not important enough. But I think this one is. I think the HDR quality and contrast is. YouTube and Xbox primarily, Q7 is fine. <laughs> Series X, Q7 looked great. Yes, the QM8 has an HDR pop, but all the core essence of the QM8 is in the Q7. Now, if you really game a lot, HDR, HGIG, all that stuff, then get the QM8 because it does get you that HDR impact from HDR gaming. But if you casually game on Xbox, you know, whatever, you, just a collection of titles, SDR, HDR, it doesn't matter. Q7 is fine because that game bar does make a difference to me. And YouTube looks great on both, right? We're not counting pixels here with YouTube. Q7, larger size for gaming, you will enjoy it. So yes, get the Q7. And this is a good point, Michael. Size matters, especially watching movies. At my house, it's an ultra short throw, 120 inches. Ultra short throw against the wall. But because the image is so large and we're like 10 feet away, my family loves it, right? They, they would rather just wait until it gets dark, turn down the lights, and boom. Netflix, streaming, YouTube on 120 inches from 10 feet away, lying in bed. They prefer that over literally the A95K around the corner in the bedroom. Or right in that same room is a Q90R that's 65 inches. Like, ah, it's too small. <sighs> Size, you know, when it's that big, it's just the kids, the wife. That's it. Yes, before we head out, make sure to click like, right? Leave me something to remember. Thank you, Lisa, for that reminder. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up soon. Looking for any last minute questions, and then we are off. Best 85 inch this year, depending on your needs. If it's gaming, it's probably still going to be the Q95C. But if gaming is not a consideration, right? It's just streaming content, movies, the X95L appears to be on everybody's list. Depending on how much cheaper the X93L is, Brian, uh, he, he just did the six hour comparison. 95, 93, 95 clearly better in blooming control. And, and I'm not going to do any spoilers beyond that. But the 95L, money, no object, that would be the choice. But since he's a gamer, he himself would choose the Q95C because it has the features he wants. But just overall, all around, the 95L, 
if this X90L is any indication, then I believe it. I haven't seen the i5L yet, but at the shootout, well, hey John, the X90L is disappointing. Only because it's 1400. Believe me, if it was 850, it would beat out the Q7. But at 1400, I, I cannot recommend it right now. Now, as it goes down to closer to 1200, I think it's consideration, under consideration for sure. QM8 75 inch or X93L. So, QM8 75 inch. If you are an HDR kind of guy, but if you have YouTube content, full screen, black bars isn't an issue, then the X93L you will enjoy more. Cable box, right? Bad sources, YouTube TV, and you don't really, if you don't notice black bars even, the X93L overall is just a smoother TV. But if you are sensitive to black bars and you want that extra HDR pop, you're gonna get a touch of it with a QM8. I think it really is specific to your preference. Why don't you start with a Sony X93L? Start with that, and if you feel it's not bright enough, go with the QM8. But if it's bright enough and you don't notice black bar issues, you'll enjoy it. And if you're watching mostly 720 and, and 1080, 1080 is not an issue. All the TVs look great. It's not 720 or 1080. Actually, both TVs look fine. It's low bit rate. Low bit rate meaning bad internet, cable box, or YouTube TV, right? YouTube TV, even with a gigabit, looks terrible. So Sony does fine, actually, with that. And the QM8, you just have to adjust the smoothness settings and it should be fine. Okay, I think we are almost done. Okay, let's wrap this up. Final thoughts. The X90L, Sony X90L, definitely an improvement from prior years, it's between the black bars, phenomenal. It, it's as good as it gets, right? It's definitely better than the Q7 and better than the U8K in many ways. Uh, I would not hesitate to recommend the X90L. Unfortunately, if you're sensitive to black bars, it's non-negotiable. That's a deal breaker. And unfortunately, it's $1,400 right now or 1400 plus right now. I cannot recommend it at that price. However, if you're wanting to stay under 1500 and you have really bad sources and you watch full screen, get the Sony X90L because it's within your budget and it's good with all sources and in full screen, you're not gonna notice the issue. And its contrast is better than the U8K and better than the Q7 and that is noticeable. Darkroom watching, I mean, out of the box, this is one of the few times where I can say the X90L really is a premium TV and with the budget between 1000 and 1500 it's within that budget. But if you're looking for the best HDR impact, I'd say get the QM8 over the U8K. The U8K needs work. Contrast falls short, to the, falls short of the QM8. Dolby Vision, still broken, washed out, lifted. The Sony Dolby Vision looks great now. So I think Sony has addressed Dolby Vision Dark. So it's, it's recommended. It's just you have to be willing to pay the premium. And I forgot to mention, if you guys didn't catch it at the beginning, the Sony box for the X90L, easily the highest quality box <laughs> I've seen. Heavy duty, it's not going to break, and it's perfect to pack. I mean, it is very well done. This is the first time I've seen a box that's just normally on the A95K, you know, expensive flagships. This Sony X90L is in a box that's better built than the S95C. Somebody think about it. So yes, final thoughts is that. Now, don't forget, please click like. And until next time, my friends, stop the FOMO.